Okay, so we're back in the second hour with Aaron Franz, um, talking about transhumanism, um, the technological revolution, and um, the post-human world. Um, we're going to talk about a number of different subjects uh, in this hour, basically um, what this kind of technology is. We're going to go into a lot more detail on that, um, and also how serious it is as well, um, because it's being marketed as being something that's um, inevitable, something that's fun, something that's really going to take humanity up to a new level. Um, but when you study what this is, uh, you realize that that's really not the case at all. So, so Scott, there's a quote there from the NBIC pre-publication. Um, now, the NBIC was basically a, it was a meeting held back at uh, Loyola University back in 2001, where a number of um, academics, uh, policymakers, and corporate bodies got together um, on the subject of nano, um, bio, in informatic and cognitive technologies uh, in the name of improving human performance. Yes, and uh, this was organized and sponsored by the National Science Foundation and the Department of Commerce. Uh, so the, the piece is um, it's titled Hive Mind, and this is a quote. If we can easily exchange large chunks of knowledge and are connected by high bandwidth communication paths, the function and purpose served by individuals becomes unclear. Individuals have served to keep the gene pool stirred up and healthy via sexual rep uh, reproduction, but this data handling process would no longer necessarily be linked to individuals. With knowledge no longer encapsulated in individuals, the distinction between individuals and the entirety of humanity would blur. Think Vulcan main meld. We would perhaps become more of a hive mind, an enormous single intelligent entity. And that's the end of the quote. Yeah, and um, mind you, this is the National Science Foundation and Department of Commerce and everybody who is uh, gathered at that uh, workshop. It's them saying this. It's not some hippy dippy goofball like uh, spouting some weird stuff on an acid trip. This is serious stuff. They actually mean it, and they're talking about the role of the individual human being within the greater system as it is emerging. And uh, with systems theories and all that, it goes back to cybernetics again. And much of this has to do with, well, everything has to do with our perception of the world and how we see ourselves. And basically with the emergence of high technology and computers and all this, we have taken that, which is our technological creation, and we, uh, we idolize it so much that we actually describe our own humanity in the terms of our creation so we're describing ourselves in terms of our technological creation so <laughs> we're building up technology uh and we're claiming that we we are that technology and, and so, so that's what leads us into the situation and the hive mind is just um it's a perfection of that particular point of view, that, that system that they're talking about, because it's about the overall system that is society. How does it work? It works on getting the individual to subordinate their will and their time and their effort to a great extent toward uh, ends that they probably wouldn't pursue if they didn't feel as if they were forced to do something, as something as simple as going to work. You know, I mean, like most people hate going to work and they verbalize this and there's plenty of comedy uh, about this, like, yeah, oh, I hate work, you know, and that's just kind of laughing off a deeper issue, which is what are we doing at work to begin with? Um, we're working towards this greater, uh, greater goal that is the um, building up civilization as we know it. And th there's this ties into so many different areas. Of, but, but again, um, the, the perfected version of the hive mind is, um, is that the individual 
eventually doesn't serve a purpose anymore because it's a, the more effective way to build up the larger system is to have connect the nodes because people have become people are uh, identified as technology now there's no difference between technology and humanity or biology it's all the same thing now cybernetically since it's all the same thing we should connect it in the most efficient way possible so we set up this giant network of uh, human beings with they're connected in some way either through a brain chip or just through uh, even through internet connection at a basic level but with transhuman technologies it gets further you connect them and you create this hive mind because it will that's the way to actually build a macrocosmic mind and you can actually as symbolically you could view each individual as just they just become a neuron or a node or a little portion on a computer chip to help that chip operate uh, all the faster and progress and go further and go further and go further it's all about taking technological progress further yeah yeah that's right and um <clears throat> it's uh, it's interesting to see um going going a little bit deeper into into how this stuff's being promoted and um how it's um kind of being sold to the public um it's interesting to see that so many of these ideas in a, in a kind of a basic kind of vague sense um have been sort of injected into the new age culture and obviously the the unabomber documentary goes into this but um kind of more recently um, I'm just looking at your book uh, in the chapter, Let's Get Real. Now, this is uh, Aaron Franz's book, Revolve. And um, in there, you've got a quote from um, Barbara Marciniak um, in her book, uh, Bringers of the Dawn, which um, I believe is a New Age book uh, where she was purported to be channeling some kind of, um, some kind of extraterrestrial spirit or some kind of um, you know, non-local consciousness. Yeah. And she says... What is occurring upon the planet now is the literal mutation of your physical body, for you are allowing it to be evolved to a point where it will be a computer that can house this information. And I just thought that was very interesting. I know. Just look at the terms that they're using in that. They're using the terms computer, uh, housing information, evolve. And they're linking this to evolution, of course. And uh, all at the same time, it's in this new age spiritual context. So it's the actual rising of technology again to this level of religion, a new religion where we're, we're spiritualizing machines uh, <laughs> and whether or not they deserve that, uh, that, that deserves to be questioned. But yeah, yeah, we, we, see, we see the connection between the transhumanist agenda and this new age so-called channeled material if we're not questioning what this channeled material is where what channels is it being broadcast from that's what we need to ask where's it channeling down from you know what i mean because a channel is just you know it's like a one little uh, offshoot of a larger thing so where is it being channeled from it's not being channeled from some alien being in the pleiadians or whatever it's being channeled from high levels of uh government likely or the military or be uh, because um, these pieces are I'm convinced uh, complete propaganda pieces to <laughs> link the new age and transhumanism together because they're all one agenda when it comes down to it that's right and um, we see a lot of this stuff coming out um, in so many different areas um, especially in the new age about uh, global consciousness and global shift and collective consciousness and collective shift and all these sort of collective ideals where yeah. the uh, individual's mind is, is yeah. just sort of transformed into a, a collective sense and that, that ties directly into the MBIC quote that Scott read out before um, because um, some of the most scary technology that they're talking about there is um, the neurochip or the brain chip and that's actually a chip that can be implanted in the brain um, with all kinds of all kinds of different possibilities. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, um, yeah. The neurochip is a real thing, and um, this is this is what they're promoting. It's it's amazing. <laughs> it's 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 amazing to see this. Sorry, sorry to interrupt you. No, no. Go ahead. In, in regards to the the hive mind, I mean, this is all being promoted to us and. When you think of it, there's been no real uh, sort of public debate about the direction we're going in. It's, it's just sort of happening. 
and um, there's no debate about um, is it right to I mean they, they talk about perfecting society I mean um, there's no debate about is it going to help us or is it going to be destructive to, to us in any way you know no yeah there really is no debate it's just a bunch of ideas rammed down our throat and then uh, eventually we again we, we come to accept them because we take them as inevitable that's what this always is so the issue becomes uh we have to remain critical and kind of force a debate and be like hey look this this is debatable whether or not you say it is and we're going to continue to bring up these points and we're going to continue pointing out uh the dots because we can see the many dots in in this world and we're connecting the dots and we've drawn a picture and uh we're gonna take this picture into the public square and show everybody and like hey look look what i found here it's a nice little drawing um i'm not the one who made it i just found it uh sitting in my attic (laughs) but uh it's an important thing for us to all look at because this is where we're going and um so we just got to keep pushing that debate and keep pushing uh, reality out in into the public domain. Yeah, yeah, um, and and I think it's really important to talk about why specifically, and especially in relation to technology like the neurochip, um, why why that needs to be debated and why that really needs to be brought out um, into the public domain to, for proper debate, you know, and proper analysis. So people really, really actually know what this technology is because obviously, um, you know, kids are, are being sort of, you know, saturated with, with all these movies about, um, you know, getting upgrades through like movies like The Matrix and being Iron Man, you know, and having super abilities and basically being better than they were before. But, I mean, when, when we look at the history of where this technology has come from, who's funding it and the kind of philosophies that these people have got, and what they really want for the world. I mean, it's far from it, isn't it? I mean, if, if someone was to actually get uh, a brain chip installed or implanted rather, um, and thus would be connected to basically the internet or what's coming in now is obviously the cloud, um, that, that's it, isn't it, really? There's, there's no turning back from that point. If you, if you are willing to let your personal inner consciousness your individuality be connected out like that to all other information then you will lose who you are and there's no going back is there yeah well yeah that's it because uh, the fundamental issue is who is developing that chip that you put in there and we get the proponents of these technologies giving us the valid excuses to take neurochips again the valid excuse in this case being that we'll have control somehow over the chip which is which is the absolute most ridiculous thing one of the most ridiculous things i ever heard you did not develop that chip and uh, what the proponents are going to say is that it's going to be open source technology and that's the way around it we're going to do this open source and it's going to be totally transparent everything's going to be transparent and it's going to be okay because everybody's going to be a scientist too and everybody will be able to work on their own chip and they'll have control over their own chip in their mind well well i say no i say no that's not how this um technology has come about it's come about through decades decades of research that's been done through the military industrial complex uh through uh, the university and military system uh long time in the making what what do we know of that do, do we have all the uh research papers on that i are, are we experts in this field like are we just pretending like we know what we're doing like because that gives us some false sense of security and, and also makes us feel cool like we're in control like are we really in control of these things i say no that's right. I know when you think of it, I mean, so much of this technology is coming out of the, the military industrial complex, uh, of places like uh, DARPA. And I mean, these uh, organizations the, um, that, that are for warfare purposes. So, I mean, to say that it's going to be totally open source and transparent, um, uh, I mean, that, that is debatable. Naive, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, look at it this way, right? Uh, if, we, if we look back, Okay, so we've got 
some of the computer stuff that we've got around today is, is open source. I mean, operating systems generally aren't, but um, a lot of other stuff is. Um, wh- when has any other life-changing um, technology been uh, transparent and open source? You know, When is it not being controlled by some massive corporation who has a monopoly on it and decides how it's going to be used and you know, totally. who's going to have it and for what reason? You know? Yeah, and even when a good open source or independent technology arises the giant corporation or comes up and buys it up and then then they have controlling interest in that yeah that happens time and again yeah over and over again i yeah. mean i mean i think i think this is one of the things which you can you can never really talk too much about is 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 this connection here when we're talking about um this this transhumanism technology and uh, the most important parts of it um is this link um, between what was its origins, um, and obviously we've talked a little about the philosophy and, and um, the eugenics and the, the sort of Darwinism, but basically where it's been funded. And um, you, as I was saying, you, you can never talk about that too much because um, look at the military uh, today. Look, look at the history of the military, um, especially in an American context, um, the history of industry, history of corporations, um, and, and even the history of the, the politicians and the super super national think tanks that are behind them. And the answer's there for you, isn't it? I mean, Absolutely. you don't have to look and, and to link the philosophy to the funding and the creation, creators of these technologies, again, in the NBIC report, they go off. They write specifically about Darwinism. They, they write about that, and there's... They, they talk about how to Darwinize society with these converging technologies. And they also, interestingly enough, talk about in there about culture creators. And they use that term specifically, culture creators, how, have, how they have to uh, elicit culture creators to promote these ideas. And that comes back to the promotion, the predictive programming. So they just write openly about this stuff, about uh, how how uh, Darwinism is, you know, part of their philosophy and part of the impetus for developing these technologies and how they're going to use culture creation to get people interested in it, how they have to uh, create partnerships between government and these uh, supposed what what look like grassroots movements. Oh, 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 and I should mention this too. This uh, I just thought this. Um, William Sims Bainbridge is the guy at the NSF who... He was big in sort of organizing this conference, and he was the guy who actually uh, wrote up the report. He was the guy who organized the report. He's also connected to transhumanism, transhumanist group known as the Institute for Ethics and Emerging Technologies. I believe Sorry. I believe mm-hmm. he's a fellow with that group, which is basically the same thing as the World Transhumanist Association. And in this section, he's the one who wrote the section about culture creation as well in the report. And he is saying that we need to find these movements that can help advocate this idea. And lo and behold, he becomes part of one of the the most important uh, groups, one of the most important movements. And there you go. You see the tie right there. (laughs) There it is. Yeah, it's... Uh, for people who are actually wanting to go and look at the documentation, it's all there. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I was, was going to uh, say as well, it was interesting what Adam was talking about earlier on, about, um, you know, you know there, there is a point where there's no turning back, um, because we, we can witness so many times in society that when, once something comes into the mainstream, it's, it becomes normalised so fast, so quickly. Um, th- things become normalised, you know, um, there's so many different examples of it. Um, so yeah, there is definitely a point where there's there's no turning by, no turning back with these with this sort of technology. Yeah, and so many things have been normalized that were totally abnormal just uh, decades ago within our lifetime. I know I've noticed this myself even since I was a youth. I used to watch TV and notice how the standards were changing just as I was uh, young. I was like, man, they're showing more and more on here. And like, this is getting pretty intense. And I I remember what wondering, I'm like, where are they going to end up with this? Are they going to have like nudity? And uh, are they going to have like full nudity on TV? Is this like really where they're going? And they've uh, basically done that. and, and, And they're going for the ultra violence and just like, the total twisting of uh, all human, natural human social roles are just totally turning them on their heads. 
and any sort of uh, mores and folkways that we used to have are just get totally getting thrown out the window and, and things that would have been things that you could not have even uttered at all like like in uh, conversation even with like a close friend because they would have condemned you now it's just like lighthearted jokes on on uh evening tv it's like oh that's a funny it's funny to talk about stuff like that now it's it's that's, it's hilarious that's, uh, sorry to interrupt. That, that's culture creation for you right there isn't it absolutely yeah i know i was, I was thinking there as well about um you know uh, virtual reality and the avatars and things like that i mean when you think of it um uh, it's amazing the the, the processor speeds of uh, computers um, that they're accelerating at such a rate, and you, you think about Moore's law, and um, that they're talking about in the future uh, is going to get to the point where graphics will become so realistic it will be like almost um, like perfect. You know, it will be like perfect graphics. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, idealized version of the real world, better than the real world. Yeah, yeah, yeah. better than. Mm-hmm. So they talk about like um, terahertz uh, processors, all that sort of thing. Yep, yep, yeah. They're uh, again, just yeah, yeah. totally. Yeah, computing gets faster all the time, and uh, that trend isn't changing. And yeah, it just allows for these things to go further and further. And uh, yeah, I, I mean, even with the amazing graphics in films, even like the best Hollywood films, I mean, they're going to pale in comparison to what virtual reality systems will be able to do i mean we're going to actually or i don't know if we is a good term but people will actually be living in these synthetic realities uh doing living out fantasies basically and um of course that's going to happen that's and that's where this is all heading and why are why would people not do that of course of course they do because um again it's you get addicted to these things and once you're addicted addicted to anything you, uh, it's very tough to stop that's the nature of addiction uh, I know I was also thinking of um, that there's been so many articles in the, the mainstream newspapers uh, into regards of the, the year 2020 mm-hmm. um, the, the guy uh, Chris Parry who did the um, Department of Defense uh, document uh, strategic trends. He, he he talks about sort of matrix style uh, downloads into uh, school children by 2020, and I mean the public reading that sort of article, you know, it's like um, that's like you know crazy. Uh, you know, they they would just dismiss that sort of thing straight away. You know. Yeah, totally. But as you're saying, at the same time, uh, the official reports are saying, yeah, this is what's going to happen. Mm-hmm. So yeah, and, and again, the official reports are also saying, "Well, this is what's going to happen," and we need to put the culture creation out there to get people in line with it, basically. So, so they say all of it. The, the, the entire agenda, as it were, is contained within these official pieces. It's it's all there for in the, in their in writing for people to yeah. look at. So it's quite obvious. Yeah. yeah. I mean, they, they always put it in very diplomatic language, don't they? Um, and it's always, um, it's always presented to you as being something that's it's either far off from the future, you don't need to worry about that, you know, um, or it's, it's in the past. Oh, well, well, things have changed since then, you know. So basically, you know, don't, don't worry about it just now. And um, so it kind of disarms the mind, you know, it's, um, yeah. from thinking that it's anything serious. And then, of course, once that's done, they, they bring in their, their culture creators to promote this in, in just about every other area. So you just get adapted bit by bit by bit by bit, and the standards change. And um, before you know it, um, you know something they said that was happening, what was going to happen in twenty years. You know, it's more like more like five or six years. Yeah, yeah, or it's now. Yeah, totally. Yeah, it's yeah. now. Yeah, <laughs> yeah or ten years all, ago. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we're always looking to the future, like, oh yeah, that's what's going to happen. We are never looking at what we're actually doing. That's that's a big trick to all this too. It never. Yeah. Always confuse people and get them thinking about the past or the future, never about what they're actually doing, because then they might actually do something about it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's right. Um, it's the great way of disarming the mind. And I mean, if you just, I mean, just Scott made a comment about you know, sort of like processor speeds before, you know, of these these brain chips sort of going up into the terahertz, you know, 
Um, and it just reminded me of um, so, some work that somebody did once on on technology and the black black projects and where technology really was. And um, he had basically um, uh, he determined through um, you know a number of inside sources that um, when the public were getting um, like 667 megahertz processors in their laptops and in their PCs back in like 1999, um, the NSA. Uh, actually had those clock speeds uh, and pretty much the same kind of chip um, back in uh, 1962. You know, so it really it, it goes to show you just how far ahead they they are. I mean, if they were that far ahead back then, you can only imagine how far ahead they are now. And so, even documents like the NBIC document, I mean, that will be kind of uh, <laughs> yeah. that'll be um, that'll just be the public level stuff basically. Because I mean, if we've got a copy of it, then we know that they're way way, way further ahead, don't we? Yeah, yeah, sure. And they're always uh, uh they're always being prophetic with this. Yeah, they're always saying, "Oh, it's it's coming." Yeah, and, and um totally. They they're absolutely ahead because uh just just when we see what they're saying like, "Oh, yeah, this is going to happen." And then it does. I, that alone is um telling you uh what's happening. But also when you look at the actual programs like um the DARPA programs, they have <laughs> they've, they've got so many going all at once, all these initiatives that um, different companies and universities can uh, get grants on. And, and there's a million, there's so many of these things and they all sound like they're the exact same program. They, they've got these like quintillion speed computing programs and all this. And they're actively uh, giving out research grants for these constantly, like so many companies working on it. And at the same time, DARPA is overseeing every single project that they give a grant out to. And they have, uh, th they get to sort of collect all the work from all these different initiatives they have on the go at the same time and combine them. And there you go. That's how you converge the technology. That's kind of, DARPA specifically is an organization that is sort of like this, um, it's the umbrella to all these groups it, it, it takes all it, it sets out the initiatives it sets out what they want to do and then it consolidates all of the research into one convenient lo locale basically so yeah of, co of course they're way ahead because the, they're the ones doing this yeah they're, they're far ahead that's right yeah i know i mean when, when did uh, darpa part of the military industrial complex when, when did they suddenly become interested in and helping the the ill and the sick and the, and the mainstream, you know, the the, the the public, you know, I mean, I mean, these uh, things were specifically, you know, structured for for warfare purposes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and the war. Uh, one one of the big secrets is that the war is not on uh, Afghanistan or Iraq or Libya or whatever. The war is on us. <laughs> They're waging <laughs> war on us. Yeah, the, the war's <laughs> on you out there, you know? Yeah, that's the, so, that's the real secret that uh, most people will want to deny until the cows come home. Is it okay if I read out an article from the, the, the Telegraph newspaper? That'd be wonderful, yeah. This was from uh, the, the Daily Telegraph, and it's titled, Brain Downloads Will Make Lessons Pointless. Children will learn by downloading information directly into their brains within 30 years. The head of British uh, Britain's top private schools organisation has predicted. This article, article came out in uh, June 2008. Chris Parry, the new chief executive of the Independent Schools Council, said matrix-style technology would render traditional lessons obsolete. He told the... Times Educational Supplement, it's a very short route from wireless technology to actually getting the electrical connections into the, your brain to absorb that knowledge. Mr. Parry, a former Rear Admiral, spent three years determining the future strategic context for the military in a senior role at the Ministry of Defence. He is now preparing the ISC's 1,300 private schools which collectively teach half a million children for a high-tech future. He told the, T, the TES that the Keanu Reeves thriller may not look like science fiction in 30 years' time, 
within 30 years, sitting down and learning something will be a thing of the past, Mr. Parry said. I think people will be able to directly access matrix style all the vocabulary you need for a foreign language, leaving you just to clear up the grammar. And uh, that's the end of the article. Man, that's something else. Again, uh, well, we see a military official there telling you how schools are going to operate. So we see the connection to the military and uh, public education system. And we also see the Matrix movie culture creation again being used. Like, oh, it's the Matrix. So we see the use of these films pop up and with the matrix specifically is a big one because there's another similar article that came out recently about an artificial memory chip, which is just another brain chip that stores memories. Uh, the title of the article was the matrix reality, uh, artificial memory chip. So they use the matrix reference again. So over and over, they use the same culture creation to, uh, further their agenda because that's what, that's what it's there for. Yeah. And, um, I mean, if anyone was ever any doubt, about about what what's going on here i mean that article was about um a a military guy a rear admiral um, basically teaching children that brain chips are going to be a thing of the future and they better get used to it and it's a really cool thing okay so i mean (laughs) yeah yeah, that that says it all right there yeah yeah yeah, it does high military (laughs) official just telling you that there you go this is it yeah that's right i mean you know with there's culture creation, and we sort of talked about that a bit in the first hour, and we've we've touched on it a bit um, in the second hour as well. Um, it's something we could really, really spend a lot of time on because it goes so deep and it, and it relates to so many other areas. Um, but I mean, when, when something like that happens, when you've got an admiral, a military admiral, <laughs> um, going to schools and teaching kids that um, you know they'll basically be living inside the matrix, and it'll be really cool. I mean. You don't even need culture creation, really, do you? <laughs> no, that, 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 that tells you everything. They're, they're coming yeah. out in the open and telling you. Yeah, yeah, that's right. And because of the amount of marketing that's being done on this um, through all these different types of movies, I mean, that's not even going to be seen by the public as something that's necessarily like an evil or bad thing because it's like, well, you know, he's a, he's a high-standing member of society. You know, he, yes. he came yeah, and that's what was going to happen. So. Well, what's wrong with that? You know, I mean, it's, he said it's good. He's an expert, so we should trust him. Well, let's go for this, you know? Very good observation because he automatically gets a free pass because he's a high military official. And we're trained from birth to worship such people. We, we literally worship people that are with high up, high rank within the system because belief in the system as it is is a religion. And it always has been. That's how you... That's how you keep the wheel moving. And um, the the real question is why are we not why are we not allowed basically to question some somebody like that? Why? How does somebody get a free pass to basically be a god walking around on Earth and everybody just just loves them and looks up to them no matter what they say? Like what kind of what kind of world are we living in? You know what I mean? Maybe we should. Uh, be able to question anybody without uh without fear of of uh being chastised for it like oh you can't say that because he's a good person we've been trained to we've been trained to accept the authority figure you know and because this guy's a rear admiral um well he's the expert so he must know what he's talking about um there's actually another quote here um which scott's going to read out along the same lines yeah the 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 same uh, the same person the Chris Parry, who's a, a rear admiral, um, he, he was involved in um, doing the, 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 the document. It was shown in the, the, the Guardian uh, newspaper, um, but this is a quote from the... Uh, it's called the, the DCDC Global Strategic Trends Programme, yeah. 2007 to 2036. And the, the DCDC is the... I think it's uh, the, the Development Concepts and Doctrine Centre. That's right. Yeah. And they're like a sort of a think tank for um, the UK, but I think it also spans to NATO as well. Hmm. Um, but this is titled uh, Broadcast to the Brain. Hmm. It says, by 2035, an implantable information chip could be developed. I like the way they say could be. <laughs> yeah, um, could be. Could be developed and wired directly to the user's brain. 
information and entertainment choices would be accessible through cognition. I can't even say that word. Cognition. Yeah, cognition. <laughs> <laughs> and might include synthetic sensory perception beamed direct to the user's senses. Wider related ICT developments might include the invention of synthetic telepathy, including mind-to-mind or telepathic dialogue. This type of development would have obvious military and security, as well as control, legal and ethical implications. End of quote. Yeah, so many issues there. Uh, <laughs> where do you even start on that one? That's, yeah, where do you that's start? Everything. That's everything all in one. It's literal mind control for one. It's beaming synthetic sensory perception to your brain. That's uh, just basically implanting a false reality directly in there. And, yeah. you know, mm-hmm. once it's a false reality in there, I mean, what's what's the difference between that and the real one? You don't know anymore. And frankly, most people probably wouldn't care, you know? No, no, they wouldn't. And it, it, um, this is this is the scary thing. Because of the technological society um, that we've created in the last, well, mainly the last century, um, and because of the amount of culture creation um, around technology, um, you know, a lot of people wouldn't care. And um, it, it reminds me of the, the quote from... Um, uh, Ke- Kevin Warwick um, that you featured in your film um, where he's basically talking about how in the Matrix um, he thinks that Neo is basically a bit of a party pooper um, <laughs> and he says that hey well um, you know if I can have um, a machine tell my brain that I'm happy that I'm satisfied um, it can give me all these cool sensory experiences um, and it can give me um, all, all the sensation and satiation I could ever want then, then hey, why would I want? Why would anybody not want that? You know, what, yeah. what's wrong with that? You know, yeah. and so it really goes to show this kind of um, this this sign, this absolutely left brain scientific view of the world that's being promoted um, through um, all this technological propaganda and through these these transhumanists, and a lot of that is, is obviously rubbed off into the public as it was designed to. So. You know, people will read quotes like that and go, oh, well, okay, cool. I mean, I can, I can probably have, um, you know, I can be a muscle man in virtual reality. I can have the, the chip tell me that, um, that I'm, you know, Superman, that I'm flying or what have you. And, you know, um, and kids are going to be going to be loving that, aren't they? Yeah, totally. And again, the synthetic telepathy issue pops up again because we yeah. see here in the strategic trends report, they're saying, oh, yeah, synthetic telepathy. That's what these uh, chips will, one of the things they'll be able to create. And you were mentioning Kevin Warwick. He is a big pr- proponent of this exact concept. He's always saying, oh, yeah, we're, language is just crap anyway. Like, it's not good enough. We're, we're going to be able to make synthetic uh, telepathy so that people can con- contact each other brain to brain and really communicate uh, in a deeper sense. And so, so he's... He's a front man again, and he's always hitting uh, specific points. And you notice this because you see multiple interviews with him, and he says the same things over and over and over and over and over and over again. So he's got specific points that he has to hit. Synthetic telepathy is obviously a big one, and um, we see it in this report. And I've also done a piece on the Georgia Guidestones where they talk about the creation of uh, the, the creators of the Georgia Guidestones knew about this too. And um, they talked about creating a living new language. That's like the third, I think that's the third um, thing on their, on the actual guy's sense. It says create a living new language. And in their book, or, or the, the, the guys who actually uh, commissioned the monument, they wrote a letter basically saying why they did it. <laughs> that's quite a letter. But they, they uh, mentioned that um, academics and scientists should develop a living new language that will connect humans and machines they say that specifically so we see this synthetic telepathy idea pop up and oh all over the place and uh again connect the dots because it's all the same thing all these different areas they're all they're all connected it's all the same project yeah and also when you're talking about that it also makes me think about um uh, uh, where, where does uh, privacy come into this as well? Because uh, when you're talking about telepathy, and we, we know we're moving into a surveillance uh, sort of society as well, so w- w- it seems to be all sort of blurring together. You know, where, where does it stop? 
Yeah, that. yeah, totally. It's, it's not just now it's not the data mining of your activity online. And from that, trying to extrapolate what somebody was thinking, what they're doing, a psychological profile, because that's what's happening right now. Uh, it's going further and actually taking the raw uh, data directly from your mind with, with a chip that's embedded in your mind, getting the raw data and having that on here. We're like, oh, now, now we really understand our motives and motivations and understand everything. And again, uh, <laughs> It's in the name of safety and security for looking for those dangerous types of individuals and deviant thoughts, and that's another way it'll be sold and safety. But, yeah, privacy out the window. That's well known. That sort of ties into pre-crime as well. Yep. Yes, it does. <laughs> yep. Yeah. I mean, that's a whole, that, that, that's a whole uh, hour's topic in itself. Yeah, pre-crime. Yeah, definitely. Um uh, yeah, <laughs> that's, that's definitely the the direction we're going is in uh, law enforcement taking on a whole different role. It, it totally changing what law enforcement actually is, um, sort of getting it to be. Uh, well, again, it's the 1984 idea of the thought police where you can't even think of something wrong. Otherwise, you will be punished. And when you get people who are afraid to think in a certain way, then the effect on behavior is uh, profound. And you get people basically turning schizophrenic because they're trying to control their own thoughts so that they don't have bad negative thoughts. And uh, George Orwell's fiction is becoming reality, as we can see, because he always knew that that's the direction that um, the establishment was going. And they actually wanted that to happen. Yeah. Mm-hmm. If you can, um, if you can um, elicit um, some kind of negative emotion or some kind of pain to do, um, or something something uncomfortable to do with certain types of thoughts, then the individuals actually start to self censor those, and they, as you say. I mean, schizophrenia is obviously a big part of that, but they will—they just won't think them anymore. You know, those thoughts will be will be basically um, eliminated through through that process, and that's the whole idea. I mean, I think um, Dr. Jose Delgado actually made a statement about this: how they would basically implant electrodes um, under the scalp of children um, at a very early age. Now, this is ideally speaking, of course, and it's probably something that's going to happen as well, but. Um, they would implant these electrodes um, under the scalp of, of children uh, at a very early age, and these electrodes would be connected to the brain. And through their neuroscience, they would be able to understand what um, you know what specific thoughts could be eliminated um, through the delivery of a small shock to the brain um, whenever the child basically thought that. So. Um, there would actually be implanting technology um, into, ch- into children that would prevent them from thinking certain thoughts because basically if they're growing up with something attached to their head which gives them a small electric shock, and it may even be on a subconscious level, but it's enough to um, you know, sort of um, give them um, some kind of discomfort, then their, their cognitive patterns are, are literally being designed from the ground up so they never actually have the chance to develop their minds, they're, they're, they're being um, kind of, it's kind of like being whipped from a really young age into behaving the right way, but through this, um, th- through these brain chips, you know? Yeah. It's, and that's, that's a really scary thing. It's really, really dark, you know? Very dark. It's the perfect evolution of the twisted education system we have now, where uh, yeah. the ideal they talk about is instantly downloading information. Like, well, what does that even mean to begin with? Like, you're just throwing a bunch of data into the mind uh, that that's uh, it's totally negating the idea of critically analyzing that data it's just the consumption of massive amounts of data like that is the ideal like the more we put in there the more smarter we are you know that's based and that's really idiotic when it comes down to it that's not what intelligence is it's not just like throwing a bunch of so-called facts up and like Oh, I I have more facts stored on my internal hard drive than you do. This is it becomes like a stupid contest of like numbers. It becomes a numbers game, and this ties into the effect that technology has had on us and how we view ourselves again cybernetically 
as technology. We're like, oh yeah, we have to be bigger. We have to be more. We just have to throw more in there. It's not about, oh, we have to understand what we are. We have to understand the world that we live in, like uh, in a deep, rich, uh, profound kind of way that, and again, this, it's about interconnectivity and how things link together. It's not about that. It's just about acquiring the most the, the acquiring it's just about becoming bigger and bigger and bigger and when reality that's a flawed model to begin with mm -hmm. i was thinking there of an article that i saw in the, the the mainstream newspaper i can't remember what newspaper it was but um it was talking about um using electrodes in the brain to do a deep uh, electrical stimulation um where you could alter the, the chemicals in the brain, and you, you could make um, it, it could be used in depression to to help someone um, um, to, to alleviate the depression and uh, to make them happier. Mm. And I was thinking, you know, that that, that could be used um, with everyone. It'd be almost like a brave new world where you, you use a soma. Mm -hmm. so, um, so if you felt uh, sort of dark thoughts, you, you could uh, stimulate your your own uh, brain chemistry to um, to be happy again. Mm -hmm. So I mean that there could be many functions for for that sort of uh, application. That's a that's a key aspect of the transhuman project as well. Is paradise engineering? Those are the terms that they use. One of the co-founders of the World Transhumanist Association, David Pierce is the big proponent of this philosophy of paradise engineering where they see it's uh, our moral imperative to delete all forms of pain and to multiply all pleasure and totally delete all painful emotions, painful uh, anything that, that hurts. When <laughs> in reality that is incredibly dangerous because what pain and suffering and even emotion – uh, so-called negative emotions were labeled as negative these all these are are just signals telling us that something is wrong and that we have to change something so um by effectively blocking out these signals that are telling us oh look, look we have a problem uh here maybe you should go about changing it the transhumanist idea is to just uh block out that feed basically so, so that we can no longer uh, understand that something wrong may even be happening to begin with. We just we're totally uh, we're we're happy and we're content with everything, and that's just uh, empty, vacuous pleasure is the ideal. Like oh, it, and how could you be against that? It's good. Like it's just it's just so ridiculous. They actually heavily promote these ideas, and and, and they write pieces on Brave New World saying like oh well most critic most people who talk about Brave New World got all wrong like oh. The, this is what we think, and the, the deletion of uh, the deletion of all things negative is what we need to do, and it's our moral imperative to actually do so. If we don't doing it, do that, then we're doing a bad thing. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's so easy to take these ideas from minorities and, and bring it more into the mainstream and, and normalize it. Yeah, uh, totally. Yeah, but there's so many. I can think of so many different applications. Um, I mean, I've seen so many articles on this sort of thing, and the, uh, I mean, there's so many directions it could go in. Oh, absolutely, yeah, and that's again, that's where science fiction comes in. Science fiction has explored all the well, some of the directions that this could go in. And with Huxley's Brave New World, it was a warning of sorts, saying, "Hey, look, yeah, this is what will happen if uh, things continue the way that they're going." <laughs> Yeah, yeah, um, and I think aside, well, not aside, but along with um, along with all the this kind of positive promotion that we're seeing, um, like all these new art, news articles and all the movies, um, you know, all the science fiction that's been around for some time now. Um, there's also another side to this, and that is the <clears throat> necessity of doing this, um, and and this is where transhumanism ties into so many other things like the green agenda as well um, now <clears throat> a perfect example of this is how kids uh, are now being raised in line with the, the global warming narrative um, and the whole carbon neutral thing um, to believe that basically 
they are, well, humanity is a virus on the planet, a cancer, um, and we must all be carbon neutral, you know, and basically our very existence um, is a problem, you know, and um, so when, when you tie that into the, the whole carbon neutral thing and you, and you look at how kids are being told that, you know, basically if they're switching a light on for more than 30 seconds, they're killing a polar bear and Antarctica, mm -hmm. um, you know, the, the whole idea of getting technology implanted into the brain um, and into other areas of the body so that it's powered from your own body, um, that, that, that's being promoted as something that's actually necessary. So people are being led to believe that not only is this um, uh, a positive thing, um, but it's actually completely necessary. And um, there's, there's an article here from the Mail Online, um, which I'm just going to read out. Um, the title is, um, We've Got You Under Your Skin, um, Battery-Free Surveillance Device That Can Be Planted Under the Flesh. So it says, A new generation of battery-free surveillance devices which can be implanted under the skin and transmit over huge distances via wireless have been developed by scientists. Researchers who are working on nanomachines that could be injected into the arms of patients and then report back, sorry, report back to doctors who are monitoring them from miles away. So there's also a um, medical tie-in there as well. Um, they would be powered by the motion of a person walking or even the pulse of a blood vessel. So it would never stop working until the person died. And, of course, that's, that's eco-friendly. So that's just an example of a device that's being promoted as the new normal. Um, obviously, there's plenty of justifications and things like that um, for, for security and, and keeping control of those damn terrorists and, and whatnot. Um, so it's not going to endure. I'll, I'll be right back. Hold on. Sorry. Okay. So we're back after a minor technical um, hiccup. And um, we were just talking about um, how certain technologies are being promoted in the mainstream media and news articles, um, how they're being justified. And I was in the middle of uh, reading an article um, in the Daily Mail. Now, I'm just going to continue reading this um, because it says that this type of technology could also be used in CCTV cameras attached to small flying craft, which use their own motion to power themselves. Such devices could be used by hospitals to locate patients or perhaps check if they are following their treatment plan. So again, it's focusing on vulnerable people and, you know, how can we argue with that? Mm -hmm. um, but there will also be of interest to the military and the criminal justice system, which is constantly on the lookout for new ways to spy on criminals. Keyword being spy. Mm -hmm. The advancements were reported in the journal Nano Letters by... Zhong Lin Wang of Georgia Tech University in the US. He said, it is entirely possible to drive the devices by scavenging energy from sources in the environment, such as gentle airflow, vibration, sonic wave, solar, chemical, and or thermal energy, he said. So again, this ties into the, the whole green agenda <laughs> where people are being trained that, uh, to think that um, you know, we can't be using any power um, you know, we've, we've, we've got to, we've got to um, have devices that, that run off ourselves, that run off our own bodies. You know, we, we are the battery. We can't be burning things. We can't be um, using resources, you know. So it's, it's not just um, being marketed as a positive thing. It's being marketed as something that's absolutely necessary, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, it's an amazing connection right there because you get these little pizza electric devices that we're powering and that are spying on us. And in a way, you get to justify the spying through simply labeling it as a green technology and a solution like, oh, look, we can make these things that are powered off our own bodies. Like, that means that we could uh, get energy uh, in other ways for other technologies. So that's one way you kind of like offset and throw off your um, critical analysis of this story just by uh, calling it green from the get go. But uh, at, at the same time, yeah, this is um, fundamentally about placing devices in our bodies that <laughs> monitor us. And uh, yeah, yeah, the, the, the health tie-in is, is huge there because um, in a world where uh, we do have these sort of devices monitoring our critical systems at all times, again, the health industry itself becomes a part of that 
larger system that offers safety and security because you need these things embedded in you to be safe because like if you don't have your critical systems being monitored at all the time we'll go oh no you could have a heart attack who knows what'll happen like some sort of some sort of uh health disaster could happen and you'd be left helpless because nobody'd be monitoring you so again ties in the health system with the whole security state with uh, monitoring everything everybody does with the green agenda <laughs> with, with transhumanism it's again we see uh, the connections between everything yeah yeah it's it really is incredible when you when you look at how how many of these different agendas all are all feeding into the same place so they're all basically heading in the same direction and um something that um is is come up um with me when when i'm looking at um how the stuff's being popularized to the public and you've got so many different demographics in the public you've got people who are into certain interests and certain sort of um causes certain groups and certain sort of political ideologies and those kinds of things and uh, transhumanism is always marketed to them in, in the right way for them you know it, it always appeals to to the right demographics in the right way and um i think the zeitgeist movement um and the venus project are, are a classic example of this because although they don't allude to transhumanism directly in their public um work for the most part anyway you know not in their films and, and things like that um, if you listen to what Jacques Fresco and Peter Joseph are actually saying, um, then they, they are actually talking um, about transhumanism. You know, they're talking about the, the need for man and machine to merge um, to, first of all, get rid of all these useless, troublesome emotions, and second of all, to save the environment. And people who are familiar with uh, the Venus Project uh, and the work of the Zeitgeist Movement will know that... Um, their sort of fundamental premise is that um, the world needs to be centralized um, into a, a planetary regime um, that is run on basically an AI supercomputer. Um, it would be a resource-based economy where you've got some kind of AI that is deciding what needs to be done, you know, um, water over here, food over there, you know, upgrades and maintenance over here. Um, so th there's a huge amount these kinds of ideas that are permeating um, what is becoming um, a, a really popular kind of alternative culture. Um, but when you actually look um, at, where, at, at where they're going and, and the kind of things that they're saying, and um, most especially the kind of um, philosophies um, that they're continuing on, um, it's, it's really not an alternative agenda at all, is it? Yeah, well, there you have it. It's the uh, promotion of the establishment's agenda through um, the label, the convenient label of anti-establishment. It's saying that um, it's the tapping into youthful rebellion, which is constant, just a, a fact of human life. Uh, youths rebel and they start questioning things. So uh, what you do is you take advantage of that as with all other natural uh, traits of human life <laughs> and um, you tap into that rebellion and you get you actually repackage your ideas and when I'm saying you are I'm, I'm talking generically as the establishment I think which I think we've pretty well outlined what the establishment is on this broadcast you um, the establishment's agendas you need to package them in a way that actually appears to be anti-establishment and yeah, if we're looking at this idea of a centralized system, for goodness sake, run by an artificial intelligence machine, and this is the ideal to shoot for, it's it's the actual promotion of a scientific technocracy, yeah. again, through countercultural uh, channels. And specifically with the Zeitgeist movement, I've noticed the theme of they use the same meme of humans are terrible and we're just going to destroy ourselves anyway if we don't do this we need this uh intelligent system to do it for us like they play on that meme that which is yeah. one of the most critical memes that ties the transhumanism that makes the transhumanism uh, agenda that how how it's sold the meme being that humans are inherently flawed they're evil they're going to destroy the planet they're terrible uh 
therefore we need to remake humanity or completely replace humanity with something better and well there it is there's artificial intelligence would be the replacement or a transhumanized post-human uh creation would be the improvement over that horrible horrible humanity so this is a self-destructive ideology that is being broadcast as you say to many different demographics it's not just the anti-establishment countercultural youthful rebellion demographic it's every single demographic you'd think of you know you got wired magazine you've got uh forbes magazine for like the 50 year old businessman uh, you, you've got all these different channels for different demographic different different demographics saying the same pr stories again to bring it back to the pr stories are carbon copies same ideas same memes pumped out in these these different demographics and that's how the agenda rolls on yeah yeah and you can see that through the promotion of these ideas and there's so many different demographics in so many different ways ensures that the the culture that they're creating um um it, it's just like it's a saturated culture it's, it's absolutely it's wall to wall you know that they're well, when they're promoting these ideas through so many different areas there can be no escape from it because it, it has be, it's promoted as normal and it becomes the new norm in every area of life. So there's nowhere to run, you know? <laughs> totally, totally. And at the same time, we're all thinking in our silly little clicky mentalities because that's what they've got us locked into. But we're yeah. like, I am a businessman and I have nothing to do with counter-cultural ideas. I am the establishment. Well, no, maybe you better rethink that idea because your ideas are the exact same ideas as the anti-establishment movement. And likewise, you could take that same argument in reverse see uh, we're, we're thinking so generically and, and we're we're actually divided to a great extent and united at the same time so we we get this false sense of division as if oh yeah i'm uh, my viewpoint is right on the world and i'm so much smart we, we all think we're so smart we all think we we know everything and like our stupid little opinions are like the epitome of truth when in reality our opinions are sold to us through public relations propaganda uh, read Edward Bernays. He could, he goes on and on about this, and uh, so that's the reality. Our opinions are given to us, and they all line up perfectly. S- supposed contra- contradicting views are actually the exact same views, and they all lead to the same agenda. And it behooves every single one of us to uh, ego check ourselves and be like, "No, wait a minute. Maybe I, my little opinion about the world is not." completely correct maybe i don't know everything like i've been told and convinced myself that i do maybe i should stop being a control freak in my little corner of the world and think that i it's, it's ridiculous we, we've all become control freak maniacs and at the same time we don't know we don't even know what we're doing we're yeah. we're, we're out of control and we, we need to just stop and be like okay time to be sensible time to uh just uh actually uh reflect on ourselves uh, actually yeah. tear ourselves apart and be like okay you know i, I was wrong about something if yeah, we can do that, that. <laughs> observe without the ego yeah yeah um it's just just one more thing on, on what you were saying about um how you know everyone thinks that they've really got um you know sort of these original ideas about things and okay. um you know it's it's superior to all others um it's it's interesting because um you can even see that in, in the kind of ideas that the Zeitgeist Movement and Venus Project are promoting because, you know, these guys are talking about, I mean, not, not, public, not so much in their films, but in their kind of private lectures, they talk about how um, the family unit is basically, it's outmoded. It's no longer needed, how children are uh, a, pain, a pain in the ass, as I quote <laughs> Fresco, you know. Yeah. Um, and, and he talks about how uh, individuality is basically a corrosive force that needs to be, you know, stripped out of society. Um, you know, so you look you look at these kind of ideas, and um, this is the exact same thing as, as Huxley was talking about in Brave New World. You know, mm-hmm. so th- these people have grown up with the uh, the kind of literature, um, not even knowing what it really was, and, and having taken on those ideas themselves when they've just they've basically just been indoctrinated from the people before them. You know, and now they're passing it down to us. So, yeah, S- self destruction. That's what it self-destruct- is. Self-destruction. That's what all this is. We're, we're, we're being convinced that we need to destroy ourselves. And uh, if you think that's a good idea, go down that road. I, I happen to not think it's good, and I think that we should start asking questions of these wonderful leaders that pop up here and there in, in the world. Maybe we should start questioning them and 
that that yeah. that'd be a good goal. <laughs> yeah, but I mean, in tying in with destruction and with self destruction, that there's kind of a, a much bigger thing going coming well going on here, isn't there? there? There's something much bigger and much more arcane and kind of esoteric that we're all being drawn into. And um, you've gone into this in your book, Revolve, um, in, in quite a lot of detail. And it's something I, I'd like to talk about because it, it's really important um, to be able to take this step back from all the details and kind of zoom out a little bit and look at the overall process that's, come, that's um, coming to fruition here. And, and it, it's basically an alchemical thing, isn't it? Where if you look at ha what's happening in the world in, in so many areas with, with politics, with geopolitics with um, economics and, and finance, um, um, with, with media, with technology, with so many different areas, everything's kind of being pushed into this revolutionary state where it's, it's kind of like this Armageddon end times programming where everything is just being pushed to its absolute limits so that it can crumble and then the new, the new world can be born out of that. Um, this this new collective hive mind, you know, um, with a technological man, you know, man is machine, um, and that that's an alchemical um, process, isn't it? Yes, yes. Uh, again, self destruction, as we were saying, and it indeed is an alchemical process. This is something that mystifies many people when you say it, because that's the nature of alchemy. It is mysticism. It's the actual practical application of the ancient mystic tradition. That's all that alchemy really is. I mean, so many people like to pretend like it's this purely spiritual enlightenment thing for bettering yourself, which at one level, that's exactly what it is. But at another level, we're talking about the macrocosmic building of uh, a utopian civilization in one in one sense that's uh, one of the goals but um, in another sense it's it's always been about apotheosis uh, man's rise to godhood and that's what my book revolve man's scientific rise to godhood is is about fundamentally is about this process that we are living through that we are uh, contributing to unconsciously for the most part but now some of us are becoming consciously aware of what's happening uh of our own place in what they call um the initiates of the ancient mysteries their great work they call it the great work and uh, like i was saying uh, most of us are unconscious that when we go to work every day we're actually doing our little contribution to the great work and mm. when we're not conscious of what we've actually been building up to, uh, if, if it's an unconscious process on our part, uh, once the lead of alchemy is turned into gold, it will be a perfected version of, it'll be the perfect version of the process itself. And the process, this is getting kind of convoluted, but what, what I'm meaning to say is that uh, our unconsciousness will become a perfected unconsciousness. And this is the enslavement of the transhumanist agenda that could very likely happen if we do uh, alchemically perfect uh, ourselves, uh, ourselves being unconscious slaves, if that's, if that's indeed what we are. I, I, I'm not saying that that's what we have to be or that's what we are. That's what we could be if we never take a moment's uh, time to think about what it is that we're doing we are unconscious automatons and we will perfect ourselves if that's what we really want to do um i'm saying that maybe not all of us want to go that way and uh, maybe by throwing um a stick in the spokes of this wheel that's revolving the revolution the the wheel spinning around Maybe just throwing a little stick from a tree that we pick up off the ground will stop the revolution. <laughs> yeah. Um, it's interesting that you brought up the great work because um, people involved in the truth movement will know that, um, you know, um, <clears throat> Freemasonry is, is, a, is a very important part of this because um, the, the rites and rituals uh, and the symbols of Freemasonry are something that really do permeate to the, um, the upper levels of the pyramid. 
Um, and, um, you know, we, we do know that uh, many of these very powerful people um, who are behind governments and behind corporations are indeed Freemasons. Um, so th there's much larger, uh, much more arcane thing going on here. Um, and this really does stretch back um, hundreds, if not thousands of years um, when we're talking about the great work. Yeah. Um, and as you say um, on the front of your book, this, this is about man becoming God, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. But, but what I was going to mention is that um, obviously w the, with the, the way that the world currently is, um, we're not treated very well by these people, are we? Uh, <laughs> no, no. Um, they don't have a very high opinion of us. So when, when they're talking about their great work and, and bringing man up to the level of God and, and basically creating man as machine, um, and you know there, there are many different ways you can interpret that. Um, is it, is it also going to be them that, that will be ad adapting and changing with this technology as well? Or is this technology just for us? Is the, is the great work, is that just for us? Well, that's, uh, that's a wonderful question. And yes, uh, what, kind of, what kind of godhood is it that we're all creating? And, and whose who's godhood? And yeah, what, what, what has been our function all along? As you say, we, we're treated basically have been treated for hundreds if not thousands of years as animals and basically we're uh, animals on a farm to be uh, used for profit and for um, feeding for, 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 so uh, people and, and we get so many people denying this fact that there is such a thing as a predatory class of uh, a, a small predatory class of human beings that do indeed see other human beings as animals, lower animals, and they see themselves as truly evolved human beings, and therefore, you know, they uh, they set up their system where, okay, well, if they're the animals and I'm the human, well, I'm going to, if they're going to act like animals, I'm going to treat them as such. And this is really, again, gets back to the eugenic ideology, and it, it, this is where eugenics has come from. It's just this, this point of reference this frame of mind which is very much a real thing in our world and it's playing out and the transhuman uh project has very much to do with this uh, and, and and it's it's so hard to get people to accept this truth because for for one thing they don't want to believe that anybody would be that evil but for another thing they don't want to think that we're actually in that and that much of trouble that the situation is that dire but it is but at the same time like we can do something about it. it's 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 never hopeless we always have the power to do amazing things and the agenda rolls on by disempowering us again and that this um self-destruction so the answer is self-empowerment and turning things around on uh those who would weaken us yeah, it's very, it's very interesting what you're saying there. Um, it makes me think of that book um, by Charles Galton Darwin, the, the Next Million Years. In the, in the book, he, he talks about how um, the, the establishment at the top have to maintain their own self-preservation and the, the, uh, their own survival mechanisms um, because they will be the people that are going to steer the ship or steer planet Earth. And um, so the, the public at the bottom don't really need their survival mechanisms because they, they'll be well managed at the bottom level. Mm -hmm. And they willingly give up their survival mechanisms in the name of convenience anyway. So that yeah. it works on so many levels. Like they, they, actually, uh, they actually feel like they have the permission to do this because we willingly give up so much of our own powers that that's um apparent proof that we don't uh we're, we're accepting our place as just a lower animal and um a disempowered creature and that that's where we belong so it's a really uh sick relationship that should not go on and we we need a <laughs> what we need is a macrocosmic version of a relationship therapy here mm -hmm. yeah yeah and that, that's why it's so interesting to talk about the differences between individuality and the, the, the collective. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, yeah, because with collectives, too, it's important to study group psychology. And you'll notice uh, 
with group psychology, it's it's anything but rational. It's just uh, y- you can create any ideology, and um, if t- any one person that is an adherent of a cult of any sort will have to bend their own ideas about the world and even themselves and the way they act to the uh, to the ideology of the cult. And so, and so uh, group psychology is very important and is actually taken advantage of, again, by uh, scientific behaviorists that um, employ propaganda to uh, get us to act in certain ways and to, to get us to actually delude ourselves into thinking that the world is a certain way when that's, uh, well, if it's not utter nonsense, it's just kind of a smoke screen to get us from thinking about uh, the full scope of things so, so that we're not thinking deep, just a bunch of smoke screens. Yeah, yeah, that's right. And um, I mean, it, it really does beg the question, um, what, what kind of information and, and do, do people really need um, to, to, to be confronted with before they'll they'll really get um, you know a, a reasonable idea of, of what this this great plan is or this great work is because mm-hmm. I mean th- their whole idea is is basically a globe um, full of people um, obviously the, the population would be vastly reduced and um, a, a whole globe full of, of people basically operating in a hive mentality you know and we're, we're talking the bog here you know yeah you know each person would be assigned duties and maintenance and and roles and you'd have it would be like brave new world you'd have al- alphas and betas and um and gammas and epsilons and mm. uh, i mean this this is their great work you know this is this is what they have in mind i mean these these guys aren't messing around you know yeah. and um so it it's sort of it's it's interesting and and when you think about um you know what needs to be done to kind of communicate that this this very real reality to people, um, so that they are able to to kind of cut through all the different um, ideologies that have been given. Because I mean, the science fiction's out there. I mean, the books are out there, the movies are out there, but it's always delivered in a right brain way, and people can just kind of dismiss it as being, oh, you know, that's just science fiction, you know. And so it's it's kind of a difficult thing, isn't it? Yeah, because there really is a higher context here that scares uh scares everybody to death and um that reality is that (laughs) we really don't know everything and that we are uh, there is a very real hidden aspect to everything in our life and and we're, we're not really willing to give up the false sense of security that's given to us by so many false gods in this world uh government um religions or whoever an individual giving us an ideology that's all false senses of security we're, we're, we're not confident enough unfortunately at this point in time to say hey you know what uh these authorities are no such authority and um they're actually getting the whole goal here is getting me disempowered so that i don't actually think twice about what it is i'm doing and that i there's actually a higher aspect to my existence and and this this is what sort of in a way it transcends the information that we have to relay to people because i mean we're doing a good thing by putting out the real uh hard evidence of what we're talking about but in a way like people don't want to listen and listen to it because they can just dismiss it what it takes is an individual person like realizing like it, it goes it goes beyond information itself it's like an individual choice and it comes down to the existence of free will, which is an interesting topic. We've all been convinced that free will is, well, it's debatable and there's no such thing, really. I mean, you can say that there is or there isn't. Well, the way it comes down to it is, are people ready and prepared to accept the responsibility of free will and everything that comes with that? Uh, and if they are, then we can... Uh, we can really do things, but it, again, that's that's an individual choice, and the destruction of the individual is well underway with this technological nightmare that's being built. Up. But um, it it fundamentally comes down to free will as our ultimate gift that we need to uh, stand up in defending, it, and we each have our own. Uh, we we have to do that all on our own, unfortunately. Okay. So you can't really make anybody do it. 
Yeah, that's right, because there's so much going around that's to do with collectivism in some way or another. You know, it's, uh, it's, it's all about the we, the us, and the our, you know, and we, we need to do this, and they need to do that, and we need to group together, and we need to get more people, and we need to, you know, join parties, and we need to wave flags and hold signs up, and, um, you know, this is just getting, I mean, I'm not, I'm not trying to take away the, the power of some of these things, but this is basically getting um, people more into groupthink and, and, and taking them away from their own individual core and people finding their own individual core and really kind of cutting through all the different ideologies and ideas and cultures that have been thrown at them to buy. Um, that, that is the, really, it's the only real solution to this, isn't it? Um, because only a true individual who really knows themselves is going to be someone who's going to be immune to the kind of propaganda and the kind of sort of this Orwellian trickery that they use to, to sucker people into the various agendas. Yeah, yeah, it's a tough thing to do that, but uh, it's a worthwhile thing to do at the same time. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so, we've talked for an hour and a half now, um, we've covered a lot of subjects, I think it might be about time to round things up. Um, now, for people who are interested in hearing more, Aaron does a lot of work on this kind of thing. Um, obviously, he has the film Age of Transitions. He has the book Revolve. Um, and he's done a number of podcasts, which are up available on his website, um, theageoftransitions.com. And I believe you're also doing a series at the moment on the, the symbolic sort of meaning of all this and, and the kind of stuff we've just been talking about recently, Aaron. Yeah, that's right. I'm doing a series of podcasts specifically about the ancient mysteries and how uh, the symbolism of the mysteries is actually uh, it fits into what we're talking about here with transhumanism and it's actually always been about um, a practical method of getting people to do certain things and a practical method of mind control basically so it's uh, my interpretation of the many and varied symbols of uh, the mysteries and it will be a long long series and I hope it, uh, people will find it valuable and I will also be encouraging people to take the podcasts and uh, share them with others and do what they want with them maybe making videos of them or whatever so this is a this is a group effort and I'm putting this info out there and I hope people will take it and run with it yeah yeah well we thank you for the work you've done. Um, obviously, the, the, your work's been greatly informative and educational for both for both me and Scott, and um, it's, it's been really great to have you on the show. Um, we really appreciate you taking the time to talk to us today, and it's, um, it's been a great conversation. We've really covered a lot, and um, I just hope that um, the people will be able to take the next step from this and start researching these things on their own. Sure, yeah. Thank you very much for having me. I, I very Listen, much yeah, appreciate it. Thanks again for coming on. Yeah, thanks again. Adam, it's yeah. good speaking to you. We'll, we'll definitely do it again sometime. Cool, sounds good.